series called Romans, the power of salvation. It's the power for salvation. And so we're talking about some good stuff, and today is one of those days I'm excited about because it is just good. I love the Word of God. I love to study the Word of God. I love to teach the Word of God. I like for to hear people respond. We're not a quiet church. You make sure that you say amen or woohoo, whatever you need to do, right? And I miss Reuben here today because he's my woohooer. And uh, but we're here. We're glad you're here. We're a big family, and we are wild and crazy, and and we just love to have fun. And you could tell we love to eat, and we love to uh, just have coffee and just get together. And so we're glad you're here this morning. Uh, this wouldn't be the same without you. It just would not be the same without you. So thank you for being here today and worshiping with us. So today we're going to be in Romans chapter 2. Flip over there with me, if you will. Romans chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible under your chair. And uh, you're more than welcome to use that Bible. If you don't have a Bible at home and you say, I don't have a Bible at all, take that Bible. You know somebody needs a Bible? Take that Bible. You could take that Bible to them and you could use it. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 2 and we're going to be in verse 12. And we're going to go through some scriptures here, and we're going to just dive into God's Word. We're going to get some practicality, and we're going to walk out of here changed than what we ever have been. I, I said it this morning. Uh, uh, time change means somebody's life's about to change. I love it. You fought your way to get here, and the enemy tried to keep you out, but you're here. Some of you are watching from the couch at home or in the car driving. Whatever your situation may be, I'm excited that you're tuned in, watching, and ready to go. All right, we're going to talk about power for salvation because one of the things that God put on my heart is for Romans is that we need good theology, but we also need to know what God's heart is. And there's some people that they have a lot of theology and they have no, no relationship. And so today we're going to talk about uh, being set free from religion. That's a good topic at church, isn't it? Set free from religion. Man, I tell you, we need to be set free from religion. Uh, we're created in the image of God. And here's what I know. We all start out longing to be good people. We're always fighting for that. And the Bible terminology used is righteousness. And we all long for righteousness. Last week we looked at uh, uh, judgment and justice and righteousness, and we long for that. We see there's something wrong in the world, and we want to fix it. Somebody needs to fix it. And, and Paul tells us, we go back into the first chapter for a moment, Paul tells us how to be declared righteous. How to be declared righteous. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 17, it says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Somebody say, I'm not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation. Jesus saves us from Satan. Jesus saves us from hell. Jesus saves us from us. Jesus saves us from the wrath of God and all of our bad decisions. And the gospel is the power to salvation. And it goes on, it says, to everyone. Somebody say everyone. Everyone who believes. Do you know that person that you're thinking about? You're like, I don't know if God can reach them. Well, just remember, he reached you. There were people at one time that thought, there's no way we're ever going to reach this guy. And it goes on in verse 17. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The point of this is we're all unrighteous. There is no one good. The Bible even says there's no one looking for God. There's no one looking for God. We're not good. God alone is righteous. And we know that Jesus came down. He lived the perfect life. He taught us how to live. He gave his life for us. He was uh, crucified, buried, and rose on the third day. And he is interceding for you and I today. When you feel like everybody else is against you, you may feel like your pastor's against you. You may feel like your mama's against you. How many know you're in trouble when mama's against you? I think that's the, that's the list. You don't want God against you, then you don't want your mama against you. But God is for you, and he traded places with you so that you could take his righteousness, but he took your sin. Isn't that awesome? I love this about Jesus, and what a great trade. All of our sin for all of his righteousness. It's a beautiful thing. There's three threats that I have found to the righteousness of God. We talked about in the first week, in Romans uh, chapter 1, actually it was the second week, we talked about the unrighteous. 
We talked about that unrighteousness. And, and, and what this is saying is in that chapter, it's saying that God's fine with my sin. We said that you can't judge me and God can't judge. Only God can judge me, right? Only God can judge. You hear that all the time. Here's the problem. You created a God who's comfortable with your sin. And so he's not, you're, you don't think he's going to judge you. And so this is a, a, a threat to righteousness. In other words, I'm already good enough. You know why? Because I compare myself to other people. I'm not like that person. I watch documentaries on Netflix. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Man, I'm doing pretty good. Go watch some Jeffrey Dahmer. You are a saint, right? The, the second the threat was a secular self-righteous. This is those who have moral causes and, and they're good without God and, and because I do the right thing. I have the right social justice causes. And, and, and watch this. I'm going to get real political. and I'm gonna, Like I said, if you have not been offended in this series yet, today's your day. It's going to be good. Okay? Because whenever I'm studying this, I'm like, oh, this is tough. And then I get it filtered out, and I'm like, okay, Holy Spirit, you, you say what you need to say. Uh, this is the liberals that we see in our country today. They're fighting for things. They're, they're, they're social causes and, and all this. This is a secular self-righteous because I'm doing certain things, then, then I am right with, I'm okay, I'm good. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, the third threat, and it's found in Romans chapter 12, and it's the threat of religious self-righteousness. Y'all ready for this one? This is the ones who think they're good. This is the ones that are God, guns, and country. You know what I'm talking about? This is the conservative group. Y'all ready for this? I told you, if you hadn't been offended yet, right? This is, man, I love to hunt. I love to golf. I love to, I love to uh, sports. I'm a cowboy fan because that's God's team. I'm blessed by God. I grew up in church, and I'm going to heaven on my daddy's shirt tail. The conservative. These are the enemies of the righteousness of God because it's about what I do, not what God did. I'm doing, I pay my taxes. I'm good to my neighbor. You know, I mean, don't, don't break in my house. I won't shoot you. Right? I hunt my own food. I, I'm a good, I'm, a, I'm America. But see, it's all about what you do and not what Jesus does. And it's an enemy to God's righteousness because you are the center it's about your performance. It's about your lifestyle, the way you think, not his. And I love Paul because Paul was very religious. Paul was so religious. If you're religious today, you're going to be offended. But go, walk, walk through it with me and let God heal you, okay? I'm telling you, it's going to be good. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, he states it this way. He says, as to righteousness under the law, I'm blameless. I'm blameless. In other words, you want to talk about somebody who's righteous and I'm doing all the right things? I'm blameless. But Paul knew it was not about religion. It's about relationship. Paul had religion, and that was his problem. Paul had religion, and that was his problem. And what he was missing was a relationship with Jesus where he found that on the road of Damascus. He discovered this with Jesus. He thought he was righteous because of his religion. I belong to the right denomination. I, I, I'm doing the right things. I was born in the right family. I, I'm, I'm from the right state, right? All these religious things. As soon as he discovered that his righteousness was actually getting in the way of his relationship with Jesus. See, number three, I believe, is one of the most deadliest and, and most lethal to the righteousness of God because it's our biggest problem and, and, and Jesus wants to solve that for us this morning because we think we're right. And I said this last week, there's a line that's been drawn and, and somehow we have put ourselves on the good side and we put everybody against us on the, on the bad side. When in reality, the only one that can stand on the good side is Jesus. Not one of us get to stand on the good side. Not, not any of us. So I wanna give you some religious traps. How many know we got to be careful with snares? Snares will hook you and hang you up. You ever get, I, I grew up in briar patches. Anybody ever run around briar patches? 
man, I'd be trying to go through the woods, and I'd come back with pants ripped, shirts ripped, things like that, and briar always caught me, always snagged me, always, I'd have cuts on me because of briar patches being out in the woods playing, right? And so this is what happens to us when we're religious. We get caught in traps, and I, what I found is the problem with deception, it's deceiving. And, and you don't know what you don't know, and you can't think what you're not thinking. So today I want to reveal some stuff through God's Word. The first religious trap I want you to write down is we get caught into information and not transformation. I know the Bible. I've read it cover to cover. I can quote scriptures. I can do all that. It's information, but it has not transformed us. Romans chapter 2, verse 12 through 13 says it this way. For all who have sinned without the law, in other words, they don't know the Bible, they don't have the Old Testament, will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Verse 13, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God. Did you hear that? It's not the hearers. I've been sitting in church all my life, Pastor. I know this. It's not the hearers who are made righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Here's what he's saying. We've all sinned. We've all sinned. It's it's a beautiful thing. We, 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 just, we just like to look at everybody's sins and put them in different categories and compare them and go, yours is worse than mine. We've all sinned. It's just been in different ways. We all have sinned. Come on. You understand that, right? And you know what I found is, I, I'm harping on this a little bit because I want us to catch this. We tend to recognize other people's sins and not our own. We tend to really see other people's sins. You know, I, I've said this already, but I've got to reinstate it. You don't see people protesting in the streets about their sins. There's not a website that I can go on and put my sins. I, I, and, and, you know, we, we, we've got to stop looking at everybody else, and we've got to make sure that we're ready to stand before God. We, we don't see people that stand up in the church and say, Pastor, I just want to, I just want to confess my sins. I don't tithe, I cheat on my taxes, I, I, I kick my dog, I cuss my wife. We don't do that. We just, we're not protesting those things. We're looking at everybody else. But here's what I found. The more you know, the more you're responsible for. The more you know, the more you're responsible for. When, when he talks about those who have and do not have, he's talking about the first five books of the law. And that's the, the Pentateuch, and that actually means in five parts. And, and so in the, in the five books, I want you to see this, there are 613 ways to follow the Ten Commandments. Isn't that interesting? God said, here's the Ten Commandments, and they said, God, that's just not good enough. We're going to come up with 613 ways to follow the Ten Commandments. Now, let me ask this question. Who was raised in church? Anybody raised in church? Yeah, several of you were raised in church. Here's the thing, the more you know, the more you're responsible for. We said in this, and we can become very religious very quick. What does this mean? It means listening to the Bible without, uh, and the teaching without heeding it, without obeying it, it actually increases our judgment. It increases the judgment that's coming on us. It, it does not benefit you to know the Bible if you're not practicing the Bible. It doesn't benefit you if it's on your social media or it's a bumper sticker on your car if you don't apply it. I, I, I'll confess something to you. I don't put a lot of that on my truck because, again, I told you, I believe God gave me my horn to minister to others on Cerritos. So I always kid my pastor friends. I always tell them, you know, I'll, I'm going to put a Grove or Hope or First Baptist on my truck because that let them think that's y'all. So... But, but what does it mean to be a person of the Word of God? What does that mean? The law was given to show us how bad we are and, and how we're trying to be like God, and it's not successful. It's just not happening. The harder we seem to try, the more we fail. And here's what I found. Jesus came to fulfill the law, and it's through a relationship with Him that we become more like God. He exchanged our sin 
for his righteousness. And the 613 laws in the first five books, you start looking at this, and the Pharisees in the New Testament, they looked at it, and they're just like, man, I gotta, gotta get a goat, gotta build an altar, and okay, Jesus, can you tell me, can you give me a tweet, just just wrap this up for me, and tell us, what does it mean? Can you, can you expound on the 613 laws? And Jesus said this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Isn't that powerful? I want you to hear this again. Love, the God, love God with all your heart. That's your emotional life. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. It's how you think. It's your mental life. Love the Lord your God with your spiritual life. That, that's your strength. That's your soul. And then your physical Here's what I'm saying is, in everything you do, let it be filtered through the Word of God and in relationship with Jesus. Let everything. Don't let what people do to you cause you to not have love for God. You know, I heard it said this way. You know, people say, well, you know, Christians, it's like, that's why I don't go to church. And I've never heard a bad rendition of Beethoven and thought, I'll never listen to Beethoven again. You ever hear the cover band and they sing one of your favorite songs? And you're just like, oh, they, oh, they destroy. I don't go and criticize the author or the, the one who originally sung the song. I, matter of fact, so, so what happens is we, we, we have experiences with bad Christians and, and we want to write God off. No, love the Lord your God with all your mind, your soul, your strength. And then he tells us, he says, then it's all about relationships. The second thing he tells us is love your neighbor like yourself. He says these two laws... These two, these two principles, the laws are hinged upon these two. If you'll follow those two, you will fulfill everything you're trying to fulfill. But you can't do it without a relationship with Jesus. Write this down. You're not biblical unless you're relational. You're not biblical unless you're relational. Well, you know, I don't need church. You know what I found? You don't know what you need. You ever done something and you're like, man, I didn't want to do it. I'm glad I did it. I needed that. Isn't that funny? How many times you've done something? Someone said, hey, come over for dinner. I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want to be with anybody. And then you finally do and you enjoyed the company. You're like, I needed that. I'm glad I did that. See, you thought you didn't need it. Is it possible you're wrong? Is it possible that you're wrong? Come on, wives, help your husband. You know what I found? Religious people are usually some of the least relational people. They're usually some of the least relational people. I'm going to get into that. These are people that like to throw Scripture at you, but it feels like they're punching you because they have no relationship with you. They don't build, strengthen, and encourage you. They actually tear you down, weaken you, and discourage you. See, Scripture is to inform and to transform. It's to change the way we live. People who go through difficult marriages, children that don't enjoy them, these, kind, these are religious people, right? You're, you're hard to be married to. Your children don't like to be at home with you. And as soon as they get old enough, they're gone. That, that's usually the religious, hard-nosed people. And you know, religious people tend to be lonely. Religious people, there's a lot of issues with this because they have misperceptions of their relationship with God. They think they're holy, but they're actually just annoying. Nobody wants to be around them. See, God's far away, so therefore I have to be distant. See, it's all about your perspective of God. God's angry at me, that's why I'm angry at everybody else in the world. See, God punishes me, that's why I have to punish you. God criticizes me, so that's why I criticize you. See, they misuse people, and, and they treat people badly. And they mistreat people because they think God mistreats people. Because this is the kind of God we say, God's angry at you. He's mad about everything going on. You know, just to let you know, God doesn't like what's going on. But can I tell you something? The Bible says when Jesus was crucified on the cross, it appeased God's wrath. It appeased God's wrath. See, Jesus took your sin. God is not waiting for you to get up there so he can slam you with a hammer. God is not cursing your life. You know what? God allows you to go into things so that maybe you'll turn to him. But God loves you. He's pursuing you. He's patient. That's why we need to be patient. He's graceful. That's why we need to be full of grace. He's loving. That's why we need to be loving. 
Aren't you glad God was patient with you? Do the people around you feel loved? Do they enjoy when you walk in the room? Are, is your family excited when you come home from work or is the break over? Being a person of the Word of God means that you're a person who loves God with all your heart and you love your neighbor. And can I tell you something? Don't be the one going out preaching at Walmart parking lot and down at the plaza when your own family doesn't want to hear what you have to say. See, at this church, our heart is, our mission is to love people, to build the house, and to reach the world. You have a sphere around you. You have a circle of influence that only you can touch, and God has you there for a reason. We have to be on mission. We, we need people that are not religious. We need people that are relational. See, when you're relational, you're generous. When you're relational, man, you're, you're a life group person. You're a leader. You want to raise up leaders. You want to you raise up people. You want to share your faith. You, you don't want to just give information. You want to transform people through the Word of God. See, when we open our Bibles to learn, we open our lives to love. Here's the second trap I want to give you. So we got to make sure we're not in that trap of I just have information and I have no transformation. The second trap is this, that we are covert and not overt covert and not overt. Romans chapter 2 verse 14 through 16 says it this way. For when Gentiles, that's us, the non-Jewish folks, who do not have the law, they didn't grow up reading the Bible, they didn't have church, they didn't have the Christian homes, by nature do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves even though they don't have the law. They show that the work of the law is written in their hearts. How I many you know God has written his law in your heart? No one's without excuse, Romans 1. He goes on and says, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Verse 16, on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets, somebody say secrets of men, by Christ Jesus. Paul is saying God's a good God. God's a just God. God is a merciful God. He's a right God and he believes in taking care of wrong things. God is not a God who is just passive and allowing you to get away with everything. You're actually storing up everything when you don't have Jesus. And so we see here there's two ways that he communicates his goodness and his righteousness and his morality to us. See, everyone has a conscience. Somebody say conscience. Everyone has a conscience that God has gracefully given us. And it's, it, I, here's what I found. My conscience won't save me and it, it won't get me to heaven, but it'll keep me out of trouble. It won't save me, it won't get me into heaven, but my conscience can keep me out of trouble. And if you, 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 you can't, you, you gotta be careful with your conscience. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You gotta be careful with your conscience because do you remember the first time you got ready to do something wrong? Do you remember that gut feeling? Do you remember that, no! And you still went to that place? You still did that thing? The second time, the conscience wasn't as loud. The third time, the conscience said, uh, just tugged on you. And by the fourth time, and you know what? We live in a culture that says God must be okay with that because he's not punishing me. Remember, we're not getting away with anything. We're just storing up everything. And so the conscience is something we've got to be careful with. We can't break it because you need it. People today will deny there's a God, and they deny there's a lawgiver. And then whenever there's an injustice that happens, their conscience appeals to the very God and lawgiver that they deny. They say, this is wrong. Under whose standard? If there is no moral lawgiver, then who do we appeal to? How is it wrong? Because if it just goes on what you think is wrong, was Hitler right because he thought it was okay to kill six million Jews? It was his right. It was his truth. See, we have a conscience in us. We've got to be careful with this. And then when you violate your conscience, what happens is it starts getting quiet on you. I remember the first time I ever, I can tell you right now, I see it, and I shouldn't have went there, and, man, I had a, just a, man, when you have that Holy Spirit pulling on your reins, turn. Turn away from it. 
Turn away from it. In addition to the conscience, God gave us scriptures. Now, you know there's a world out there that haven't, has not heard the word of God, but they have a conscience and they have God. They, have, uh, they, they suppress the truth. We learned that in Romans chapter 1, that they exchange lies for truth. Or they, exchange, they exchange truth for lies. They suppress truth. And you know what they'll say? That this all just happened. But you know, no one would ever look at a building and say, that just happened. No one would ever get on a plane and go, yeah, this plane just happened. I mean, there was a tornado in a junkyard, and whoop, there it is. No one, would ever do, no one would ever look at a painting and say, no, there wasn't a painter. No one would ever look at a book and say, no, there wasn't an author. This just happened. If I was out on the beach and I saw Sarah loves Jim, I wouldn't think, wow, look at the waves. They, they came in and look what they spelt. Somebody wrote that. You have a creator, and he created you, and you were fearfully and wonderfully made in your mother's womb. Your conscience is a gift to you. Protect it. God's given us his word so that we can live through relationship with Christ. And, and so it's important we have these two things. Here's the problem with religion. Religion is very covert, and it's not overt. I'm going to explain this today. Religious people, what they do is they judge everybody. And here's what they do. It's grace for me, law for you. They judge everything. But what they don't tell you is how they're sinning. They don't reveal to you how they're sinning. They're very covert. And they want to deal with your sin openly, but they don't want their, their sin dealt with. They want, to, they want to bring you out in public, but they don't want to deal with their sin. How many of you grew up in a home where it was rules for thee, but not for me? It was one of those kind of things that you saw your parents. They had these rules for you, but they didn't apply to them. Parenting is dangerous whenever you are uh, overt with your demands for the kids, but you're covert with your behavior. Very, Be very careful. Because when your kids go, how come I can't do that, but you can? Oh, I love this one. Let me, can, let me get on my soapbox for a minute. I beat the tire out of my kid, caught him smoking my cigarettes. Well, he wants to be like you. Getting my beer and, and taking it behind the shed. They want to be like you. Why is it okay for you but not for them? Well, they're not of age. And it's like, yeah, but listen, when you live a life, there's only two people in my life that were ever able to tell me to do it, and they didn't have to do it. And that was my drill instructor and my football coach. We cannot live a life where we're telling others to do something, yet we ourselves don't hold to the same rule. When Paul speaks about judging the secrets in verse 16, he's saying religious people are not better than other people. They're just better at hiding it. They're better at hiding it. If we've learned anything from the disciples, we learn from Judas that he was very, very sneaky. And I love this because it shows us that the religious person in the discipleship crowd, see, he didn't cause problems like Peter. He didn't put his foot in his mouth, and he wasn't causing issues, and he just sort of stayed in the shadows, and, and he was sort of staged left, and he didn't do anything. Judas seemed fine. He didn't draw any attention to himself. But when he does step forward, he's followed by religious leaders and political leaders, and he brings them into an unholy alliance against Jesus. He's, he has a rest warrant for Jesus, and he's put all this together by stealing from the treasury of ministry for three years. See, it wasn't that, Jesus, that, that Judas was a, a good person. He was a sneaky person. Laying low. See, that's what religious people do. He's been, come on, come up here, give her a microphone. I tell you, I, this is happening in church. I love it. Help me out. This is how religious people live their lives. You think they live on this high and mighty pedestal, but yet they're just sneaky about their sin. Jesus warns us about religious Pharisees. In Luke chapter 2, verse 2 through 3, he says it this way, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. See, because he knows everything. Write this down for me. We can hide from all judgment here, but we can't hide from Jesus. You can fool some of the people some of the time. Come on. 
Jesus knows all things. He knows everything going on in your life. Don't worry about judging others. Judge you. Make sure you're right with God. Don't be the one that you know the law, you know the rules, you know the scriptures, and you're telling everybody what they're doing wrong, but you yourself have not brought yourself under the light of scriptures. The first trap is information, not transformation. The second trap is covert, not overt. Here's the third religious trap. It's preaching, not practicing. Preaching, not practicing. Look at verse 17 through 23. But if you call yourself a Jew, someone who follows God, and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve of what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure, those who are just there totally confident, that you yourself are a guide to the blind. In other words, follow me. I know where to go. I know how to do this. Come and follow me. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. You who are confident, a light to those who are in darkness. Verse 20, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having the law in the embodiment of knowledge and truth. Verse 21, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? By the way, I'm a teacher. This is scary. This is heavy. This is weighty. While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You say that one must not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You, you, you arbor, hate idols, but do you rob temples? Who, you who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. See, Paul's preaching against the religious spirit that likes to preach the Bible, but doesn't like to walk the Bible. We'll be judged by our conscience because God's given you a conscience. We know right from wrong. Do you know they found tribes that there's no Bible, there's no God, and they will cut someone's hand off for stealing. It's wrong in a tribe. If, if they do something with their wife, they will kill them. It's adultery. You don't have, your children will, will hide when they do something wrong at a very early age. Isn't that interesting? It's written on their little hearts, and they know when they're wrong. But see, it happens all the time. And, but we're going to be judged by our conscience. We're going to be judged by Scripture. So if you're sitting here today, uh-oh, you're hearing it. And, and, and watch this. Not only are we going to be judged by our conscience and our Scripture, we're going to be judged by what we've been teaching. Well, I'm glad I'm not a teacher. Do you have children? What are you teaching people at work? What are you teaching your kids when you drive? Whoo, come on now. We're going to move on from that one. Three levels of judgment there. That's why the brother of Jesus said this, James. He said, some of you should not presume to be teachers because you will be judged more strictly. See, God knows what we're doing. Paul talks about hypocrisy. And these are people who don't, they, they, they say they don't steal. They teach it, but they steal. They don't give generously. They don't, they don't meet needs. We live in a world where, where there's political demands about people. You know what I'm sick of? Number one, let me just go ahead and tell you from this pulpit, I don't believe government's our answer. I'm not telling you not to vote, but be careful who you vote for. And they need to line up with, I mean, you need to find the, the best of the two evils, right? Isn't that really the truth? But you know what I'm tired of? I'm tired of socialist leaders who demand we be generous. Well, why don't you start with your pocket first? Do you know, go and look up our leaders. Every one of them are zero to 3% in their generosity. But yet they're demanding, give us your money so we can redistribute to everybody else. See, we call that socialism. The Bible calls it stealing. If you want to be a socialist and you want to redistribute, start with your stuff. Start with your money. Can I hear an Amen. The religious spirit demands of people that, that, that they don't demand of themselves. <clears throat> what are you preaching? What are you practicing? How do we avoid this? Write this down. Let your Bible be a mirror and not your binoculars. Reflect on you. Binoculars let you see far away. But you can't see yourself when you got binoculars up on your face. Anybody getting anything out of this today? D.L. Moody puts it this way. 
He says, your character is who you are in the dark. Your character is who you are in the dark. In other words, be the same person when you're being praised or when you're being pressured. Be the same person. Here's the fourth rule, the fourth trap. It's rules, not relationship. Rules, not relationship. Verse 24 says it this way. For it is written, the name of God blasphemed among the Gentiles, non-believers. So the name of God is blasphemed against the non-believers because of you. Paul is talking about people who are rule-based, but they don't live by it. They're legalistic. Their lifestyle hurts people. It hurts churches. It hurts families. It hurts communities, and it repulses unbelievers. This is what he's talking about. How many of you didn't like a Christian before you became a Christian? Some of you in this room, you were like, before you were ever saved, you're like, man, I don't like Christians because of that one Christian, right? This is what happens. See, when you're dealing with unbelievers, with your family, your co-workers, your friends, you got to connect before you ever correct. You got to have relationship with people. You got to come alongside them and let them know you're real. Let them know you have problems. Let them know that you struggle. Let them know that you failed. Show them what God has done in your life and where you've come from and where you are today so that you could be an encouragement. People need to know that you're for them. We can't be a church full of rule followers and, and pointing at everybody, and, and yet, but the finger never points back at you. We have to be careful with this. See, you can win an argument or you can win a person. All you got to do is make points to win arguments. And you know what? There's a lot of people out there making points. You know what people aren't doing? They're not winning people. They're not winning people. See, rules without relationships results in rebellion. I remember growing up, and we had a fence, and, and we got to play in that fence. And, and what happens is God, his, his word, is, is, uh, every, his commands are pickets in the fence. And then we come along, and we say, oh, I just think this fence is too broad. And, and we, need to, we need to bring this fence closer in. If we can get them 15 feet closer from danger, then, and then all of a sudden, how many of you know your fence, your yard becomes a prison? And all you do is focus on the fence instead of the slide, instead of the swing, instead of the sandbox. Hey, man, let's enjoy God. Let's enjoy his presence. Let's enjoy people. And you know what? If you're going to do life with people, you're going to find out they're messy. You're messy. I'm messy. We're all messy. And the moment I think I'm doing really well, my wife puts me in my place. She'll bring something up, and I'm like, thank you, God, for my helpmate. We have to be careful with this. We have to be careful with this. Let me, let me get to my ending here. The, the, the religious trap number five, I'm going to close with this. It's the outward and not the inward. How many of you know we're constantly trying to work on the outward? Look at verse 25 through 29. Now, some of you probably have been wondering, when's he ever going to talk about circumcision? Today's your day. Verse 25. Been coming to this church for five years, Pastor. I've never heard you speak. I'm glad you're speaking on circumcision today. For circumcision, indeed, is a value if you obey the law. Now, this looks silly to us, and I'm going to explain it in a moment. But if you break the law, that's the external that makes sense if you have the internal. Let, let me put it this way. Um, I'm married, and I love my wife, so therefore I wear a ring on the external. But if I didn't have a marriage and a covenant with her, the ring wouldn't make sense. Why would I wear a ring on my ring finger if I don't have a covenant with a woman that I'm married to. So that's what he's talking about here. He says, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Verse 26. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? A lot of circumcision this morning. Verse 27. Then he who physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew, a believer, who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not for man, but from God. What's he saying? He's saying we tend to focus on the physical, the outside, and God's been trying to work on your inside. How many know we come to church looking good? We come in, you know, you, you just, if there was divorce papers in your car, you would have signed them this morning. 
but you walk in the door. God bless you. Good morning. I'm, oh, thank you for the donuts. We, we so focus on the outside. That's why we have Facebook. That's why we have this social media stuff. Because you'll take 180 pictures until you find the one you look skinny in. And we all looking at it going, I ain't never seen that version of you. you know, I got I to gotta tilt my head to your skinny, right? We want to portray this outward thing about us. But he's saying it's not about the visible, it's about the invisible. It's not about the outward, it's about the inward. Oh, you fasted for 40 days. Wow, amazing. Oh, you went on a mission trip. Wow, that's awesome. Can I tell you something? It, it doesn't matter. Outward really isn't bad, but can I tell you something? God wants to work on the inward because that's what matters. Often we're trying to change the outward, but God wants to change the inward. As, as, I, as I close, get ready uh, with the band. We're going to worship and respond. But it, it tends to be with the religious crowd, and I, I want to close with this. We tend to have what we call JV and varsity. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. JV and varsity. You remember when you are in school, some of y'all still in school, and you didn't make the varsity team, you're on the JV, it's a little bit like, ah, uh, you know, you're made fun of or whatever. You, you're not good enough to be on the varsity. See, JV is when you believe in Jesus. Varsity is when you have additions to believing in Jesus. And, and this is what the religious looked like. In their day, varsity was circumcision. In their day, you had to be circumcised to be varsity. You can believe in Jesus, but if you're really going to be on the varsity team, you got to be circumcised. We look at that and we think that's silly, but we have our own circumcisions today. What, what, what version of the Bible you preach out of, Pastor? Because if you're a real Christian, you preach out of the King James. That's what Peter preached, or Paul preached out of. <laughs> what denomination are you? Because see, the real denomination is this one. I belong to that denomination. See, I believe in Jesus, but I'm in the right denomination. I'm in varsity. We have our own circumcisions, don't we? Uh, here's another one. How do you worship? Are you one of these? Are you... See, because if you're varsity, you'll get more undignified than this. See, it's Jesus plus. How do you educate your kids? Do you just shove them off into public school? Or are you homeschool? We're homeschooling. We're varsity. Uh, here, here's another one we have. Baptism. Did you? Are you lazy? You got baptized in the hot tub? I got baptized in the Pecos in January. I'm varsity. You got in your little old soft hop tub. I was, that was cute. That was cute. Varsity. Do you speak in tongues? I speak in tongues. Does God speak to you? Do you see what I'm saying? We've got our circumcisions. Be careful. Instead of looking at everyone and judging them, if you're on a higher platform than them because you're further ahead spiritually, Learn to live on a knee, not just to pray, but to reach down and pull others up so that they can experience what you've experienced. Write this down, and we're going to worship. God wants relationship, not religion. I want to ask our prayer team to come. We're going to conclude this way. I, I don't know what... I don't know what the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, but prayer team, go ahead and come. Make your way down here. Just come and line up in this front. I want, I want people that have needs to be able to be prayed for. But here's what I want to do. We're going we're to sing. And as we sing, I want you to ask this question right now, though. With every eye closed, can, can we just lift our hands like we're about to receive something, like you're about to catch it? Just like you're about to catch it. Eyes closed. Can you right now just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Because here's what's cool. I could preach for 40-something minutes, and the Holy Spirit can speak something to you in four seconds and blow your mind. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us today? Come on, I need some more prayer people. I need my prayer team. Come on, Alpha, guys. Alpha, come on. I need you up here. We're about to, we're about to respond. 
what did I say today or what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you that you need prayer about? Maybe you're here today and you say, man, I've got a broken relationship with my family and I, I think this is what it's about. I think I've been a rule pusher. I think I've done nothing but try to bring rules into people's lives and, and I'm trying to make people live up to a standard that I myself can't even live up to. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, I'm not living up to this. I need Jesus and I'm not in a relationship with him. I don't know what it is. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need healing in my body. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, our marriage needs healing. I, 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 I pray right now that if you're married to one of these people I'm talking about, that he'll bring you up here. She'll bring you up here and y'all will come and let God bring some healing to your marriage. See, here's what I want you to know. You don't have to be embarrassed about walking these aisles and coming to the front because everyone up here that is up here for prayer, that, that are up here to pray with you, not one of them is perfect. I could tell you a lot about a bunch of them. Let's go have coffee. I can share some stuff on these guys. But they also can have coffee with you and share some stuff on me. So, nobody in here is perfect. Here's the bottom line of Romans. We all need Jesus.